Hello, I'm Alice Roberts. I'm Professor of Public Engagement in Science at the University of Birmingham. And I'm sitting in one of my favourite places in the university. Uh, this is the education room in the Lapworth Museum, which is our museum of geology and paleontology. So it's full of bones and fossils and rocks. These wonderful old maps over here as well. I am part of a, an exciting project at the University of Birmingham this year where we are redefining the body for the 21st century. Now, my interest with the human body goes right back to when I was very small. I remember having a book on human anatomy, which was written by Jonathan Miller and illustrated by the amazing pop-up artist David Pelham. I must have been about seven or eight at the time, I think. And that was just the beginning of, uh, I don't know, a, a love of, of anatomy and biology. And that fascination with, uh, with humans and with the human body in particular uh, led me down uh, the route of evolutionary biology. So I'm fascinated with, with how we've come to be this way because we're not created, obviously, we're evolved and our bodies have evolved over millions of millions of years to the, to the point that we are now. And evolution is interesting in itself. Natural selection is interesting because it it doesn't create perfection. It turns out organisms that work, but they may not be perfect. So we can look at lots of aspects of the human body and say, oh, there are oddities, there are kind of, there are glitches and flaws that evolution has left us with. And some of those are because of material constraints, the materials that we have to build our bodies with. Some of them are because of embryological constraints. So, so this body that I inhabit now had to develop through embryonic development. I started off as a single cell, as did each of you, and we turned into complex bodies while we were in our mother's wombs. During that process, the embryo has to be able to live, has to be able to, to maintain itself, and, and yet it's a completely different sort of creature from, from uh, the body that it will eventually become. Uh, the embryo, the fetus, doesn't breathe air like, like I do and like you do. So it has a different sort of heart to the heart that it would eventually end up with. So we have, we have oddities, anomalies, even pathologies um, in, in adult bodies that are there because our bodies once had to do something quite different. So things like a hole in the heart, that, that problem exists because there's a valve in the heart that allows the, body, the heart to work in the fetal situation where it essentially has to be a pump for a single circulation there's not much blood going to the lungs at all but then at the moment of birth when you take your first breath that heart valve has to close so that you have a separate left and right side to your heart and you've got one side pumping to the lungs and one side pumping out to the rest of the body and sometimes that valve doesn't close properly and that's what the hole in the heart is so understanding embryonic development helps us understand some of the the pathologies that we can see later in life understanding evolutionary development also explains some of the the apparent glitches in the body too. One of my favourite ones is a nerve that branches off from a parent nerve in the neck here and then runs all the way down into the chest and then loops back up because it's forgotten to go and innovate the larynx. It's called the recurrent laryngeal nerve. In other words, the laryngeal nerve that runs back on itself. And if you were going to design a human body from scratch, then undoubtedly what you'd do is just have this little branch of nerve going straight off to the larynx like that. You wouldn't have it looping down into the chest. But because of embryonic development, because of evolution, this is where this nerve ends up. And in fact, it gets trapped underneath an artery that in one of your very ancient fishy ancestors used to be an artery that supplied the gills. So there are all these amazing stories about embryology and evolution and the way the two go together. Um, that led me to write this book, The Incredible Unlikeliness of Being. I'd been talking about these stories to, to medical students, to science students, for, for many, many years, and I thought it was a bit of a shame that you didn't get to hear these stories unless you went to university and studied those subjects. That was my motivation for, for writing that book. But there's quite an important philosophical basis to it as well, I suppose, which is, which is this idea of, of imperfection, the, the fact that you know, we're, we're not perfect. And you can extend that idea of perfection, actually, because we tend to think in terms of archetypes. So humans 
are obviously very good at thinking, our, our cognition is superb, but we do parcel up the world and categorise and label things. And those archetypes can be useful and those labels can be useful, but you have to recognise that, that they are effectively constructs. So we have this kind of idea of a, of a perfect human body and of course that no such thing exists. Everybody has as perfect a human body as, uh, as anybody else. And if you think about the species as a whole, a species cannot be represented by one individual. There is no one individual that could best represent the human species. A species is, is the sum of all of its parts. So in my research, I'm interested in plumbing some of these ideas. I, I'm interested in how close our bodies are, for instance, to the bodies of our closest living relatives. If we look in the animal kingdom for our closest living relatives, it's chimpanzees. They're incredibly close to us. In fact, we are more closely related to chimpanzees than chimpanzees are to gorillas, which is quite shocking. And when you look at their anatomy, you can, you can see that evidence of, of close relation. So, for instance, the, the arm bone of a chimpanzee is so similar to the arm bone of a human, the humerus of a human, that I reckon if I put one in a, if I put a chimp humerus in a medical student exam, I don't think they'd notice the difference. It is quite subtle. Um, the skulls are a bit different. But yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm looking at the difference between humans and chimpanzees, and I've had PhD students looking at the difference between the way we move compared with chimpanzees, um, and the, the shapes of our bones, the shapes of our joints, that sort of thing. And I've got a PhD student at the moment who's looking at ageing in chimpanzees and humans. And I think that will be fascinating when he eventually finishes his project, because I think we'll learn something both ways. I think we'll learn something about human ageing by looking at our close relatives, and we'll certainly have learned a lot more about chimpanzee ageing as well. I mean, at the moment, we don't really know uh, how badly chimps suffer from arthritis, for instance. So it, it will be a really interesting project. I'm also uh, interested in the, those kind of areas when I, when I make television programmes or when I, when I write books, I've already mentioned books, but I made a programme for BBC4 last year about the, the glitches in the human body. And then this was the basis for quite an extraordinary artistic, imaginative project where I challenged an artist, an anatomical artist called Scott Eaton. He's brilliant, check out his website. He, um, I challenged him to, to basically tweak the human body. And we started off with my body. And then I said to him, okay, so I think we should do things like slightly shorten the lumbar spine to make it more stable. So there's less likelihood of disc prolapse of slip discs. Um, it would be good to replumb that nerve in the neck, even though we're not gonna see that on the, on the model. Um, conceptually, we'll have done that. It would be great to see if we could think of separating airways and the esophagus so that you could eliminate risk of choking, that kind of thing. But I think the most extreme one, which was based on Twitter conversations, actually, I, I, I tweeted, what would you do to your body? What, what would you change about your body if you could? And so many people came back to me and said, can you fix childbirth? Men and women said, can you fix childbirth? So I included that in the challenge to Scott. And um, I said, well, I think that, you know, you could, slight, you could make the hips slightly wider, you can make the baby's head slightly smaller. And this is an entirely imaginative project. We're not really doing this, of course. Um, but I thought we'd take it a bit further than that. I thought we'd really push it. And so I went for a marsupial fix where we, in some imaginary parallel universe, humans have evolved from marsupials. So from mammals who give birth very early to their young, that would mean that we'd be giving birth to a newborn who was probably about the size of a jelly bean. And then for the rest of gestation, you pop it in a pocket. So when it's ready, you don't have to go through the process of childbirth. So Scott modeled that in to his final sculpture and it was quite extraordinary. We unveiled it at the Science Museum and it formed an exhibit at the Science Museum for most of, most of last year. It's only just been taken off display actually. I'm hoping to bring it to the Lapworth Museum here at Birmingham. And um, I, I was quite shocked when I saw this completely reconfigured me. I also had large eyes, large ears, and, and this pouch with a baby in it. So he even put a baby in it as well. It was a, it was a, a bit of a flight of fancy. You know, it was an interesting artistic project. But the, the thinking underlying that was, was, it was really this idea that we are evolved beings, that you know, we, are, we are the product of, uh, of evolution, and to get people thinking about evolution, anatomy, embryology. 
So I'm, I'm really excited to be part of this wider project across the university. And for me, the really interesting aspect of this is that it crosses disciplines. In universities, we can, we can often be quite isolated from each other. I know it sounds strange, we all work at the university, but there are, there are these barriers between disciplines and, and some of them are just geographic. You know, if somebody works the other end of campus, it's quite a big campus, I'm probably not gonna meet them easily. Um, what this project has done is brought people together from, from very, very different areas, from, from areas like, um, uh, like medical legal, uh, like philosophy, uh, psychology, and then there's you know, me as well, biological sciences, anatomy. And the conversations we've been having amongst us, amongst ourselves, have been, have been fascinating. So over the course of this year, we're going to be holding some panel discussions at various festivals and, and also thinking about how we can uh, bring our research together and, and cook up some projects that, that might cross those boundaries and, and, and bring those disciplines a bit closer together. So one of the things I'd quite like to do is tackle that idea of archetypes. How, how prevalent are they? How much do they influence our thinking? How much do we end up with, a, with a, quite a singular idea of what a perfect body um, might be? Um, how, are, how are doctors influenced by ideals of the human body? If they're looking at uh, an, an idealised human body in anatomy textbooks, does that, does that influence how they then approach real bodies when they get out and, and see, their, see their patients? How about identity? How about gender? All of these things are, uh, are folded into um, the question. So yeah, I expect to see some really exciting research projects emerging um, out of this collaboration. And um, we'll hope to keep you updated with them. Follow me on Twitter. I'm at the Alice Roberts. And I tweet quite a bit about what's going on here at the University of Birmingham, uh, as well as getting involved with discussions online and um, talking about my books and television programmes. I have got a series coming up soon on Channel 4. So Britain's Most Historic Towns is back uh, for a second season, so do tune into that. And I hope to see you all later in the year for Digging for Britain as well. But yeah, tweet me questions and I'll try and answer them. <laughs>